It gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone here today. We have a wonderful crowd for what really uh, is a historic occasion. Uh, I'm proud, particularly, that the Reichauer Center for East Asian Studies, uh, which focuses on a broad range of global issues, but particularly relating, relating those to East Asia and its transformation, um, is able to help to, uh, to host uh, this event here at SAIS. Um, as our uh, presenter today, uh, we have someone who is known well, I'm sure, to, to most people here, but I should uh, say just a few words about his distinguished background. Um, Foreign Minister Tsut Batar um, graduated from uh, Moscow Institute of International Relations and also has an MA from the Australian University, so a very broad uh, uh, background uh, educationally. I was quite struck at what a linguist he is. He speaks Russian, English, Thai, Khmer, and some German as well. His diplomatic experience, of course, uh, you, you know well. Um, but in addition to that, he has also served in a number of important administrative positions in Mongolia. He's been Minister of the Environment and Tourism, also Minister of Construction and Urban Development, dealing with some of the most important uh, domestic and social problems that Mongolia has. Um, he's a statesman. He has been a member of parliament since 2016. And particularly in that context, uh, he's been chairman of the Parliamentary Subcommittee on Human Rights. And since last October, um, Foreign Minister Tsok Batar has uh, served as uh, the Foreign Minister of Mongolia. Um, today, he's going to be speaking on a subject that, given the transformation that we have going on in East Asia and the world today is an extremely uh, timely subject. As you see, he's going to be dealing with changing world and the role of smaller uh, countries within that, which uh, I think all of us do believe in, as shown by the quality of the audience that we have today, is certainly a timely and Im important subject. So, uh, without any ado, Foreign Minister, it's a great honor uh, to welcome you here to SAIS. And thank you very much for joining us, Foreign Minister. Okay. Yeah. Well, first test how US technology works. <laughs> oh, excellent. It's working. It's very reliable. <laughs> well, uh, well, first of all, I really would like to thank you all uh, for uh, taking time out of your very busy schedule uh, to come and also thank you for uh, you know inviting me and also uh, you know making this meeting uh, possible uh, and uh, you know the subject I really want to talk today is a very topical issue for us Mongolians and you know when I will be talking about changing world it will be our perspective a smaller country perspective. And this may be different from the perspective of others. And there may be many issues where our views also will be coinciding. So uh, do you mind if I stand? Yeah. And from here, I'll be, it's easier to look at it. So the world is changing. And well, the world 
has never been stagnant. It was always changing. But nevertheless, the uh, dynamism with which, with which it's changing is posing uh, challenges for any country, including smaller countries. So one of the things that I really would like to uh, say here is that when in the early 90s, Mongolia started transition to market economy and democracy, you know, the world put behind itself Cold War. And uh, as a result, the world became very open. Everybody became everybody's friend. And then we had this romance of friendship that we're all friends and we'll stay that way together. We started taking a lot of things for granted. So at the time when Mongolia started transition, we had this liberal ideology. And uh, we had very important, you know, things that uh, uh, were there at that time was much freer flow of capital, goods, people, services, knowledge, and information technology, in addition to that, was expediting things. So in short, this was party time. We were enjoying it. Smaller countries, it really didn't matter if a country was big or small. You know, important thing was trade, money, business opportunities. And it really seemed to be that it would stay that way. You know, uh, during this post-Cold War uh, globalization period, uh, we had this unprecedented opulence. In other words, the uh, Nobel, Peace, uh, uh, Nobel Economics Prize uh, winner Amartya Sen wrote that, uh, you know, the modern world is really living in the age of unprecedented opulence. And I really totally agree with that. Just to show you, uh, uh, you know, in uh, 1960, the GDP per capita at the world level was only 400 $50. In 19, you know, 30 years down the road, it reached 3000 But starting from 1990s to 2015, within 25 years, it reached 10000 Never in human history we had this sort of wealth accumulated at this level. And uh, if just here from uh, 1990 to 2015, it really grew uh, 2.6 times. Um, also, because at that time we left behind, or we, we thought that we left behind Cold War sentiments, etc., really the issue of peace has become obsolescence, but that's a naive proposal. That's what we thought. Remember, the, I recently saw a Hollywood movie about Miss World, and this issue of peace has become the issue of joke. In that movie, they talk about, the, they're asking Miss World, what do you want? And she says, world peace. The whole hall laughs. Peace has become this subject because we started taking it for granted. We started thinking that who would go into war with each other, especially when you have this mutual destruction assurance, nobody in this global world will be going into uh, you know, war. In Mongolia, very clear example, there were people who were saying, you don't need army. Who's against you going to go to war? And that was the attitude that we started developing. And in, in addition to that, so I'm not saying it was bad. What I'm saying is that that's how nice things were. Peace, we started taking it for granted. It has become everyday reality. Nobody seemed to have been threatening it. So therefore, very rarely 
we started talking about peace. Only for peacekeeping operations in some countries, only to the, as if only in those countries peace was needed. In the rest of the world, it was there. It's like oxygen. Do we talk about oxygen? Without oxygen, we won't live. We need 21% of oxygen in the air. We don't appreciate it. It's always there, and we think it's just like that. So, and then in addition to that, one of the great inventions of, of the time was, of course, information and communication technology. And when we started talking about e-commerce, you know, information technology, commun, uh, you know, communication and proximity of everybody to everybody else, the figures economic figures started getting astronomical. You know, for smaller countries like ours, it was really fearsome because no figure of Mongolia was achieving e-commerce trade figures of, you know, bigger countries in other, of bigger companies in bigger countries, you know. With this globalization, with these big figures, small countries were getting even smaller. But still, it was, not con uh, uh, it was not negative against the countries. Everybody was talking about leapfrogging, leapfrogging over digital divide. That was romantic uh, peak times. And then, what's happening now? It seems as if the globalization as we know it is coming to an end. Uh, and I'm saying it seems, and up, it will be really up to us how smart we homo sapiens are to preserve these positive trends. And, uh, you know, the globalization is coming is facing great challenges. And you know what has went wrong with globalization? In reality, nothing. It overperformed. It performed and delivered what it could deliver. And because it was successful, it failed. You know, this is the dichotomy. You know, we human beings, nothing is good for us. If it is too good, it's too bad. We start taking things for granted. We start, we, we stop appreciating positive things about us. And therefore, what I, we're thinking, what I'm suggesting is that globalization has gone into self-implosion. It imploded under its own success because if you look at the GDP per capita and uh, the economic growth, you know, it, it is really unprecedented. Not many of us realize that today an average person in many respects is living a better life than many of the presidents some 50 years ago, many of the rich some 50 years ago. Because within this time, for example, MRA, early diagnosis of many diseases, some 50 years ago, didn't matter how much money you have, you could not have had early diagnosis of many diseases. So many people were dying. Or to, TB was not curable up until recently. Many nobilities, royals, if they contracted TB, they were doomed to perish. But it, today, it's purely, you know, completely curable. In other words, uh, in today's world, actually, ordinary people enjoy far more you know, benefits of globalization than any other people in the previous century. And yet, we think it's bad. And then, again, social media information technology was, is one of the greatest inventions. And it really added a lot of value to it, but also it is destroying a lot of things, especially with this uh, social media. When a bad news breaks out, you know how successful it gets spread. You know, especially now uh, in Europe, you have one incident of uh, an immigrant 
maybe from the Middle East. And then when it's on the social media, it is trumpeted as if that's the rule. And we start generalizing it as if it's happening every day in the street. And then what happens? We really start running into national, nationalism. So also another thing, so most surprising thing that we're having is that we had this misconception. As the pie grows bigger, everybody will be benefiting. You know, it is true. Everybody benefited. As the pie grew bigger, MRA is the most expensive technology, but today it is available and accessible for average people. So, in other words, to that extent, this bigger pie of globalization is benefiting everyone. But the problem that we have is that as a result of this fast growth, the division between haves and have knows has fundamentally increased. And there are a lot of data on this. Like, you know, the richest 1% own more than uh, the other 99%. I'm talking about global figures. Or here, you know, in 2014, eight, 85 people, you know, um, and it's Oxfam report, uh, had as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the population. You know, the interesting thing about globalization is that within three years, this figure changed to this extent. Now, just eight person on earth is having as much as the bottom 50% of the globe. So, as a result of this, what happened was that Yes, indeed, to this, for this 50%, a lot of unaccessible services are there, but still, the sense of inequality has settled into the minds of 7 billion. And that is starting to cause problems. So, what we want is equality. But we, we, we lived in a socialist society, and... In socialist or communist society, we had this equality, but that equality was a false equality. And we call it, we had the right to equal poverty, everyone. And then what we really want is this equity so that everybody has more or less same access to all the goods that the modern society can deliver. But where we ended up is like this, the reality. Really, the top rich has become far more rich beyond any you know, imagination that the rich 100 years ago could ever imagine. And the poor are left far behind. And then this discrepancy, although this person is, in terms of also benefiting from this growth, he's benefiting much better than, uh, you know, people of 50 years ago, but still, that difference is starting co to cause the problems. Another interesting thing is that this individual's and state's role in, with this information technology has been augmented. Now, one person take, I don't know, you name it, uh, Julia Assange, or, you know, individuals can affect and have much bigger impact on the global community. And the interesting thing is that recently there was this uh, research of psychologists that in this modern social media environment, the less rational you are, the more popular you're likely to get. And that is the dichotomy. And that is one of the risks that the modern technology is suggesting. In other words, rationalism and success is no longer correlated. The more you know, critical, irrationally critical you are, you will be seen as brave, as unique, 
as uh, outstanding, and then you will get a lot of likes and retweets. And many people live on that and prosper on that. Now, another, another thing, and so here, interesting thing. If an individual has that capacity, imagine small states can have a very big capacity to be influential and through irrational way. I live in North Korea, uh, in uh, Northeast Asia, and North Korea is one of the examples. Now, if you look at Kim Jong Un, how popular he is, and when you look into the Twitter community in Mongolia, some kids who grew up in a liberal society enjoy all the benefits of liberal society. They're saying, "This is a cool guy." They do not realize if he was ruling that guy, he wouldn't have that access to the Twitter and internet, but he doesn't realize that. To him, that guy looks uh, cool. So therefore, this small state's role has even grew bigger. Now, the need for more data, and you know, uh, uh, here it's also an interesting thing. In today's world, just to be average, just to live normally, you need to have data that is exceeding, keep in your mind data that is exceeding the data of top scientists some 50 years ago. In today's world, New York Times one week news is holding the uh, amount of information that a person in the 19th century for his whole lifetime would be accumulating. So, therefore, this is another stress factor in our today's society. That is to say, you need to carry a lot of information just to live a normal life. You know, that information would have been needed to make scientific discoveries in, you know, 50 years ago. But today... This is normal thing. In other words, again, for our brain, this information pressure that is put on our brain is posing a great deal of stress factor, stress. Now, uh, this is an interesting thing that I, uh, you know, would want to talk about. Modern political science, social sciences, psychology, in many respects, are getting outdated. They're not providing sufficient explanation to many of the phenomena that we're facing today. For example, in political science and in psychology, we know about the phenomenon of mob psychology or mob mentality. What it presumed was that mobs would not be always there. In order for mob to be created, there has to be social stress, some phenomenal event to get people out into the street. And when people got out into the street, a very rational people, uh, a, a very rational purpose, a uh, person who would not, uh, who would be doing rational things when he's on his own, when they get together, he would do things that he wouldn't do when he is alone. And that's what we call mob mentality. And the premise of that research and analysis is based on the fact that mobs are not always there. Some extreme situations lead to mob. But what if we live in the mob mentality environment permanently now? Social media has collected together into one virtual reality, 24 hours, seven days, and it's creating permanently this mob mentality. Because one bad news is spread out, and people are reading it, they're retweeting it, and it goes further. And one problem is over the next second. So we're talking about a community of 7 billion. There are sufficient 
accidents and incidents around the world that can cause stress on our brain. So, therefore, we are in constant mob mentality. And then our current political science would be saying that that's how people behave, but when the mob spreads, then that behavior subsides. But if it stays, then that behavior is going to stay. We're thinking now, many of the, and that's the interesting thing if you, you know, about that is that recently in many elections around the world, no sociological poll was exactly predicting the outcome of the elections in Europe, in the States. Most of the polls were wrong. Before Brexit, there was the social poll research, and then they thought that if you do the ref uh, referendum, people would vote against it. It turned out to be wrong. Voters voted in protest against the establishment policy. So that is to say that our current knowledge is inadequate. People are acting against the revelations, discoveries that we have. So that is the risk. In other words, now how do we then respond? What new knowledge we need to have? So in this respect, if the world is changing this way and our previous knowledge is getting outdated and is not quite responding to the new realities, what do we do? And what is the consequence? And here are the consequences. First, we're really getting global discontent. People do not know what they're angry about, but they're angry very often. Fragmentation. You know, this haves and ha have knows divide is observed not only inter at the international level between the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Club 20, uh, G20 countries or developing countries, but it is also within societies we have big fragmentation. That leads to nationalism. Now, with this inflow of immigration, etc., what's happening is that the nationalism is starting to get big, you know, influence. That is leading to protectionism. We want to protect. And very, I was talking to the British and I was saying, well, I don't understand. Brexit is going to hurt the United Kingdom. And why your people, the most rational people in Europe, would be voting for Brexit? And you know, one of the scholars told me, now they're vote, they know they, they're going to get hit. But they're voting on the basis of, so what? That's what I want to do. And that is a very interesting behavior that we will have to reveal, you know, understand at the same time, it's not going to go. It is apparently a new norm. And if it is a new norm, we will have to design new institutions, new methods of dealing with this. So this is leading to disputes and standoffs and conflicts. And as a result, for me as a diplomat, the biggest thing is that it is starting to threaten the peace. The very peace foundation of our development that we cease to value, appreciate. Now, in this context, smaller countries, what is the role of smaller countries? And here I propose three things. Well, pre-Cold War, you know, first, smaller countries always had big impacts on the global affairs. Very often, big countries think it's only upon us the destiny of human race depends. But it wasn't like that. So in pre, for example, Cold War history, in the ancient history, for example, Roman Empire really demised under the pressure of barbarians, smaller Germanic uh, tribes. And then we had World War I. It began due to an incident in Serbia, also another small country. Now, during Cold War, the role was a little different. 
you know, in countries like Afghanistan or Korea, Korean Peninsula, what was happening was that usually bigger states would be in conflict, but there would be this proxy war or proxy standoff. Bigger countries would be, because they couldn't go into war with each other, they would be flexing muscles, they would be testing their strength, uh, you know, in smaller countries. Now, in the modern situation, it is getting a little similar to the pre-Cold War uh, era. That is to say, here, it wasn't the smaller countries themselves. They were behind bigger countries that were rivaling uh, with each other. Here, smaller countries are starting to cause problems themselves. For example, Afghanistan. You know, in Afghanistan, when... Uh, the world community was really trying to solve the problem and then it was really hard, difficult to understand their local environment. And we left it to them. You sort out. You don't like foreigners, we understand. We're out, you figure it out. What happened was that in Afghanistan, the Taliban's came to power. And we, again, we thought, okay, under the UN charter, the internal jurisdiction, you cannot intervene into the internal jurisdiction. We respect international law. And we were staying, you know, outside. But there was, remember, there was this uh, Taliban attack on two big Buddhist statues. Very interesting coincidence. At that time, Mongolia was one of the loudest countries which stood up and said, this is wrong. We protest against it. This is an act against human civilization. Not many countries did it. But later on, interesting coincidence is that they came to attack the two World Trade Center towers. So because we didn't stop them there, they moved another step forward and then they attacked here. So therefore, this sort of these smaller countries now are coming out themselves to cause problems. The same North Korea, here in Ukraine as well. Now it is starting to cause issues, differences in the views that is leading to a conflict and problems of bigger states. So that is the environment and smaller countries' role is getting uh, is increasing the world is changing both for bigger countries and smaller countries now i want to in this context what is the policies what's going on in mongolia and what are the policies that we really want to pursue now what i would say is that mongolia was developing dynamically with ups and downs with ups and downs but in general we've been growing pretty fast and we had challenges, and we're now looking for solutions. And here, one interesting thing. We started, uh, you know, the, the transformation in early 1990s. And in 2003, we passed the threshold of $1 billion of our, our GDP. From 2003, so as you can see, from throughout these decades, it was pretty down, and it was stagnant. And then starting from 2003, we passed this, the threshold of $1 billion, and within nine years, in 2012, our GDP stood at the level of $12 billion. In other words, within nine years, the economy grew more than tenfold. And yet, if you look into the news in Mongolia, nothing is working. It's bad, bad, and bad. But behind the scene, liberal democracy and the economy, market economy, has performing and delivering this. Now, imagine, try to find in Northeast Asia a country that within nine years grew tenfold. Tenfold is 900% growth. So this is what, 
you know, what has happened to the economy. Another couple of uh, indicators. Here, uh, we're showing the, the GDP growth rate, also foreign uh, direct investment and uh, um, foreign trade. So you can see that here in 2011, our economy topped. It was, we had the 17.3% growth. We were the second fastest growing economy. So all of this, you know, starting from 1990 up to 2013, you know, what we're seeing is that, remember this liberal economy, the party time was positively affecting and supporting Mongolia. And therefore, our economy was growing pretty fast. And especially, the interesting thing is that now in 2009, with this big crisis in the Western countries, we started having this questioning time. And then the behavior of voters throughout the world in Western part of the world started changing. So, but in Mongolia, because of this liberal time, the inertia, the dynamism that Mongolia obtained throughout these years was pushing still Mongolia to this top-rated growth. And we used to have, in 2012, per annum we were having $4 billion of foreign investment. That's 40% of our GDP. And our foreign trade was also increasing very fast. And then starting from 2013, our economy started slowing down. But it is the political, internal political, uh, you know, uh, battle and inconsistency in policies. So in other words, internal politics really played a negative role in Mongolia in getting this done. But again, the beauty is that in 1916, Mongolian economy almost reached the bottom of its fall. But you know, in 1916, at the lowest point in modern growth history of Mongolia, still the economy was 10 times bigger than the economy of 2003. So that's how that's what democracy and market economy did to Mongolia. And that's what globalization and access of Mongolian goods, be it commodities, and mostly commodities, access and accessibility of Mongolian goods to the global markets. And then here, what I'm really trying to say is that this is a very simple visual effect or proof of what happened to Mongolia. You know, this is the picture of actually 1980, but in 2003, the real estate property density was exactly this. Only here, you have this building. In 2003, this building was here, and then I got Remax, a very well-known international real estate company, to calculate what was the real estate value on this part of the land. I, I was elected from this district and therefore I love showing this picture. <laughs> uh, and here the total real estate value was $250 million. Here, and it's the picture of 2018, but because of the crisis that started in 2012, you know, the there was no new building built within that period. These buildings were built already by 2012. And you know here, the value by Remax is $2.5 billion. Again, remember I told you about the GDP growth of 10 times? Here, it is proportionate. That what was happening to Mongolia. Now, this is the figure. So, but the interesting thing is that this sudden growth, what was happening globally, was happening in Mongolia. And we didn't know this was coming. And 
when the world was going global, you know, also nobody knew that this disparity of income and this fast growth in the income uh, difference would be the result. The same in Mongolia. What now? One of the biggest problem why Mongolia is always having this negative, uh, you know, coverage in the media about the situation in Mongolia is that we have big disparity in income. You can see that poverty is, a pro is standing at the level of 30% of the total population. And in 2012, it was standing at the level of 27%. In 2013, 14, it went down to 21%, and then now back to 29%. Another interesting thing, 62% of the total savings is owned by 1% of the savings account holders. So this is very reminiscent of what was going on globally. And globally, this difference in the income is causing problem, but also internally, this is causing the problem. And we will have to really fix it. So what we're trying to do in order to overcome these difficulties? Of course, taxation. And you know, in open liberal democracy, tax is a tough stuff. We have 10% flat tax. And then because people are talking about inequality, unfairness, we try to introduce uh, you know, higher taxes for those who have higher income. Otherwise, how do you, you know, equalize the situation through fair means? It's almost impossible. You don't do October socialist revolutions to take away the properties from the haves. You tax them. But when we introduce the tax of only 25%, the flat tax rate is 10%. When we introduce 25%, that few that have higher income stood up and said, bad guys, we don't like you. And you know, the very people who were saying about unfairness of the system, they stood up and said, we hate the government. They're doing the wrong thing. Change it. So we had to get back to 10% tax. But still, we will not be dropping this. You know, we will have to find a way to introduce difference in the taxing in order to equalize the situation. Another you know, means we're trying to do is sovereign wealth funds. And through these sovereign wealth funds, to accumulate wealth at the times of, at the party times when everything is growing fine, and then to reinvent, invest into the creation of jobs, new industries at the times of hardship. We are trying to develop securities market. In other words, as you see here, we're really trying to do market economy-based civilized methods. Securities market. And through securities, we're also trying to have our ordinary people buy shares and participate in the economy and have the opportunity to earn. But of course, the direct redistribution system is social welfare system, and we're trying to use that as well. But nothing is as good as it is. I didn't put the, you know, my job is to talk nice things about my country, right? Therefore, I didn't put there some of the silly stuff that many of our politicians, uh, you know, um, advocate. For example, setting up state-owned enterprises. We've been living in socialist society for 80 years, and because this socialist economy did not deliver goods that it could have delivered, we abolished it. But again, many of the decision makers, they lived in socialist society up until, I don't know, they were 20, 25. So therefore, the socialist instinct is, you know, dies very hard. So whenever they run into unconventional difficulties, their instinct wakes up. And they start thinking in socialist terms, we'll have people to work. You're living in a 
market economy. You can't force people to work. It's a very easy solution. But, you know, the interesting thing, and we talked about this IT technology, the ability to spread wrong and unproven information. When somebody stands up and says, well, in socialism, there was no unemployment. Everybody was working. They were forced to work. Everybody says, oh, this guy is talking right thing. You know, we want to be employed. And therefore, this guy is going to save us. People do not realize, in essence, he's talking about communism, which we dropped some 30 years ago. So state-owned enterprises is becoming a fashion approach for many, uh, you know, populists in Mongolia. And unfortunately, again, corruption is a very serious issue in Mongolia. But the thing is that when state-owned enterprises are there, how are you going to mitigate corruption? The, nobody's money will be always there. So that very system that encourages corruption will be there. So statistically, out of 10 people, seven will be thinking, oh, you know, if nobody notices, I'll take $1 and I'll put it into my pocket. You, so if you want to fight corruption, you fight with the system, not with the people. The system has to work in such a way that even if you want to steal something, you know that you will be caught and punishment will be imminent. Then most of the people won't be stealing. Not because they're good people. You know, you, I'm a lawyer, so maybe I'm a bad person. So you don't believe in the good of people. You believe in the good of the system. And then you make people behave properly because the system is there to catch you if you're doing the wrong thing. And we have to do it. But when you are resetting government companies, you are recreating the system that is feeding the very corruption. And that is, you know, one of the problems. Now, in this new environment, Mongolia, besides these internal adjustments that we're trying to do facing the modern difficulties. One of the things that we're trying to do is also our third foreign policy. Through our foreign policy, we want to sort of uh, keep the confidence of international investors to Mongolia. We want to have as wide, uh, you know, wide community of friends as possible. Excuse me. And we have this third neighbor policy. And then when it comes to third neighbor, it's interesting. Our real physical neighbors are saying, there is no third neighbor. You have only two neighbors. Why are you talking about third neighbor? And our response is this. In this global world, the neighborhood is not measured by physical proximity, especially in the era of information technology. You, on everyday basis, for example, here in the United States, we have 15,000 Mongolians living, right? 35,000 uh, Mongolians living. Imagine, they have their families. So assume some 60,000 people are in constant touch with these people in the United States. For, that, for those 60,000 families, United States is the immediate neighbor. These families do not on everyday basis communicate with Russia or China. Or maybe they do not communicate at all with them. But they do communicate with the United States on a daily basis. In um, South Korea, we have 30,000 people. Now, in, here in America, 30,000, uh, 60,000 may sound a very small number, but for Mongolia, it's big numbers. You know, If 10,000 people come out to the street, the government is gone. Imagine how big that 10,000 is. So, therefore, uh, 
when we're talking about the 60,000 people every day communicating with Korea and not with Russia and China, for that 60,000 people, Korea is an immediate neighbor. So, in other words, in today's world, neighborhood concept has changed. The world is changing. Everything is changing. Therefore, we're taking use of this new technologies, new approaches, and to have acquired new friends, irrespective of whatever somebody else wants or denies of, you know, denies that we have. No, we say we have it. We have third neighbors, and they're there. Uh, now, another thing that we're trying to do is uh, diversification of our economy. Again, in this global world, if this global trend stays and if protectionism does not put too wider hold in this world, then we will be able to export more, and not only commodities, but also manufactured goods. You know, we want to uh, you know, uh, develop our food processing industry, leather industry. Mongolia has only only 3 million people, but we have 66 million animals. So, and that is a good uh, base for us to develop uh, light industries. We also uh, want to improve our exports, you know, uh, potentials of our uh, industries. And we're signing, for example, free trade agreement. We've signed free trade agreement with Japan. And we're now negotiating uh, free trade agreement with the Eurasian uh, economic community. We have uh, GSP plus access of our goods to Europe, etc. And services and transportation can be, so we also want to export our services. Mongolia, yes, we're landlocked, but we want to turn it into an advantage. Russia and China, its trade, their trade will be increasing within, now by 2030, their trade is bound to reach the level of 200 billion. And we want to be the logistical hub to facilitate that trade and to tap on that trade. So that is, and as a result, and we, uh, in Mongolia, set up this landlocked developing country think tank. This is an international organization set up at the initiative of Mongolia. And this international organization will be feeding the knowledge and ways and methods of facilitating and improving the competitiveness of uh, transit transportation services in landlocked developing countries. And we want to really take full use of uh, this uh, possibility. And then another thing that we're doing is peace and promoting cooperation. For example, when we're dealing with North Korea, first of all, their nuclear policy is a threat to us. In fact, why it's a threat to us? Their nuclear weapons are not directed against us. And yet, if something breaks out there, because South Korea, Japan are, are our top trading and investment partners, if their priorities change, Mongolian economy gets hit. At the same time, in South Korea, we have 30,000 people. So if something erupts there, Physically, Mongolian citizens' lives will be in danger, and that we want to prevent. And also, there is a humanitarian, human dimension to that as well. First, we're a member of the international community, member of the United Nations, and therefore, we are obliged to promote peace as human beings. At the same time, also, we want to be helpful to our friends, for example, the United States. The United States was helping us throughout tough years, through every means. And there are, you know, two great ambassadors who were really facilitating and leading this help, directing the U.S. attention to Mongolia. And 
This worked. The fast growth that I have shown you, all the indicators, this is our common product. We jointly, with the United States, with the rest of the international community, we jointly achieved those results. But in return, because Mongolia is a small economy, there is nothing much at this stage we could give back. Then, even though the weapons are not directed against us, because it's directed, for example, against the United States, for example, we're saying we cannot agree with that. We have to stand up and say this has to stop. And to that extent, we also want to be useful to our friends and at least to say in a human way thank you for what they have been doing for Mongolia in times of hardship. So in this changing environment, we are also trying to get adjusted and design the right mechanisms of response to these big global challenges. Whether it works or not, time will show. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister Tsok Bator. Um, we have some brief commentary uh, from um, Dr. Kempi and, and uh, Dr. Bob. Um, and so as they, if they could please come up. Um, let me, as they're coming up, let me just make a couple of comments. I know, uh, first of all, I think uh, all of us appreciate that uh, Foreign Minister Tsok Bator is a natural lecturer. Uh, he has too much to do now. He's not about to uh, move into any other occupation, but I know right that here. he would be well, very, very warmly welcome um, any time that he can come and lecture at SAIS, here at SAIS. So we certainly appreciate that. The only couple of comments that I had, one of them, of course, was the emphasis that he made on technology. Uh, and in the kind of world, he put a, in a bit of a pessimistic cast on this, to my mind. But I think we also need to appreciate the ways in which, uh, for a country that has just two literal neighbors, but of course many, many third neighbors, um, technology opens uh, new possibilities. Um, the other question, and I... I do think that, uh, that one should also look to the issue of small nations in the international system and the kind of role that he play that they have played. Classically, of course, in international relations theory, um, as I think he alluded, large countries were the center of the system. Realist theory tells us uh, the size of one's military, Stalin's, uh, how many um, divisions does the Pope have? The classical realist view really was that size is ultimately what determines influence in international affairs. And um, of course that's been questioned a lot over time among some of our academic colleagues, uh, particularly people like um, uh, Robert Cohen, uh, the, the large power of small allies. Uh, some of what uh, Joseph Nye, I think, has, taught, has said about transnational relations and the power of, of networks and soft power and so on uh, certainly uh, suggests a broader view. Um, but I'd like to leave with just one very clear and concrete uh, analogy that I think does show us clearly the power of small states uh, in the past. Um, and I think suggests in the kind of changing world moving toward deeper interdependence that Asia itself represents today, it may uh, be a important uh, uh, sort of note for the future. And that has to do uh, with the story of Paul Henri Spock who, as many of you know, uh, was foreign minister of a small country. Of course, it depends on what you call, mean by small. It was 
a Belgium, uh, the Belgium in which he lived was about 150 of the size of Mongolia. And 1.6 uh, million square miles, of course, is not exactly small by uh, many um, calculus. But I think the story of, of Spock shows us the things that a small country can do. Uh, he served, uh, as I think many of you know, once as Prime Minister of Belgium before World War II and then twice in its aftermath. Um, he served three times, uh, or served for 18 years total as Foreign Minister of um, uh, Belgium. But more than what he did within his small country, the sort of things that a leader of a small nation can do on the global stage, uh, I think is something that, that makes us, th at least it made me think. Um, he really was the author of the European Union uh, in his role as chairman of the Messina Conference that led to the Treaty of Rome uh, in 1957. He was the first president of the European coal and steel community. Um, he was the second NATO secretary general. Um, he also served as the first chair of the United Nations General Assembly. Belgium was not a large nation, but Belgium was the country that pulled Germany and France that had been at each other's throats for, of course, the better part of the 20th century uh, together. It was a mediator. It was powerful precisely, and in a sense, paradoxically, because it was relatively small. It wasn't seen as a threat to the others, but it had networks. It had personal relationships with other countries in the region that allowed it to be a mediator. And to my mind, in the kind of uh, world that we're living in uh, today, in uh, the turbulence of Northeast Asia, um, the example of the transition ultimately that was possible in Europe as those large uh, enemies that had fought uh, several times with one another, like France and Germany, the way in which that small nation uh, helped to bring them together, I think is something uh, that is relevant to the future and that flows from uh, the remarks that uh, Foreign Minister Sokbater has just made. Um, that's the only real observation that I had. We do have some very brief uh, remarks from uh, Dr. Alicia Kempe, as many of you know, she's president of the Mongolia Society of the United States. And then also um, Dan Bob, who has served with the uh, Senate uh, Finance uh, Committee staff uh, and is now with us here also as a fellow of the Reichauer Center for uh, East Asian Studies. So Dr. Campy, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Calder and Seiss, to for organizing this event um, together with the Mongolian Embassy. We're very honored to have Foreign Minister Tsokbater here. It was a very interesting presentation for me as a Mongolist and a specialist on Northeast Asia and Eurasia to hear Mongolia's view in a larger sense uh, in the uh, globalized or post-globalized world. Um, I will just make a few comments mostly directed to the information he provided towards the end of the lecture on Mongolia and um, comparing its growth and development to uh, the very salient points you made about what was happening in the world at the same time. Um, one of the things that I have always been impressed about Mongolia is a country that's between two big neighbors with, in theory, limited options because of its geographical position, small size, and limited um, developed wealth, although it is a rich country, mineral-wise, um, was able to, since 1990, make such excellent economic progress, despite 
a very vigorous democracy, which is what the United States wanted out of Mongolia, but uh, this vigorous democracy brought lots of changes of government and to some extent a political instability, especially if you were a government official, um, and yet we still have, as you have stated and shown in the charts, the remarkable economic development. I have always felt, until listening to what you said, that Mongolia's uh, development and path was very much developed by the policymakers from all parties and different parts of the business community um, backed strongly by the multilateral organizations that provided that first decade of, of foreign assistance that then generated the FDI in the second decade, which provoked the huge spur in GDP. And then when that FDI began to be withdrawn because of global crises, um, we have a plunge in Mongolian um, uh, economic development, or at least now stagnation and now a beginning of a revival. Um, I'm not too sure if Mongolian people were listening to your um, presentation that the blogs wouldn't say, you see, all our problems in Mongolia were caused by the outside world because we're just following the same patterns. I would not want them to say that because although I do believe in your general premise that Mongolia, of course, was influenced by international events and globalization, I still feel that Mongolia is a unique case and it took advantages of the ebbs and flows of the global economy as it will have to now make a new way for itself in a less globalized world. And in that, I'd like to have your response to that um, mm -hmm. message. And if I can ask one specific question, one of the things that I've been following and am very supportive of is Mongolia in its diversification of its economy, thinking of itself as a transit nation, not only a transit for its two big neighbors and for Northeast Asian countries, but maybe even to a continental Eurasian transit country between Europe and the Middle East and the Pacific. So I know that you have just come from Moscow and discussed the economic corridor, the Mongolian-Russian-Chinese economic corridor that is one of the ideas of Mongolia to work with its big neighbors, but for a larger goal, and would appreciate any information that you can share with us on that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campy. Um, we do have one more uh, commentary by uh, 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 Mr. Bob. Uh, let me just add one item on to a, a question, perhaps, to what uh, Dr. Campy just indicated. You were saying earlier you had, uh, of course, you have the FTA with Japan already. Um, you're working on the um, FTA with the uh, European Union in the context of the question, Dr. Kemp, asked, I hope you will let us know how you see uh, progress on, on that uh, FTA. But with that, uh, Dan. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here with, with the Foreign Minister and, and with uh, SAIS as well. I just wanted to, um, I, I actually spent a little bit of time in Mongolia in 2001 working on a, a NED, uh, National Endowment of Democracy project. Um, focused on uh, assisting the state great Kural in, in becoming a somewhat stronger institution, uh, a, a stronger parliament. And, and I really think one of the things that struck me while I was there was the eagerness of the Mongolian people, the, the members of the great Kural, to, to make changes and make strides, not only in building a stronger democracy, but also a stronger market. Uh, economy. Um, and I'd, I'd 
in, since we have such limited comments, I wanted to focus a little bit on some of the, the final thoughts that you had uh, this afternoon on how it's sometimes difficult uh, for smaller states such as Mongolia to give back uh, to the United States uh, and you want to be useful uh, for your friends such as the United States. I, and I, I think, first of all, I, I have to say that I think Mongolia has done a really excellent job of managing its relations with the United States, um, both at an, uh, with the executive branch, but also with, with Congress. And in a sense, I think Mongolia has punched above its weight, as we say, uh, despite uh, the size of, of the country, uh, at least the, the population and, and the economic weight of the country. And I, I think part of this has to do with the strategic significance of Mongolia, where it's placed, but it is, I think, also the commitment to democratic development and a market economy, which has also aided in its relationship with the United States. But finally, I'd say it's, it's the willingness, uh, in fact, to give back that has uh, assisted in, in uh, improving and, and maintaining the relations with the United States. From, the uh, early commitments uh, and ongoing commitments in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, uh, Mongolia's outsized uh, participation in peacekeeping operations around the world, um, and it's, in, it's ongoing work in any number of international organizations. In fact, one thing I was involved in years ago is something called uh, the, creating something called the Asia Pacific Parliamentary Forum which is associated with APEC and Mongolia. Uh, this is 27 countries, I believe, at, at the moment. Uh, Mongolia volunteered to host that in 2011. So it, it's those sorts of things that really contribute um, to the, uh, the, the state of the U.S.-Mongolia uh, relationship. And I, and I do think um, being sandwiched between the great powers, China and Russia, uh, and navigating those very complex relationships, I think, probably has been useful as uh, Mongolia has, has uh, uh, assumed uh, its role on the global stage and, and its, its relationships with other big countries, such as the United States. Um, so, um, but in terms of uh, Mongolia and other small countries, part of this also uh, has to do with understanding really how Washington, D.C., works, and that always is a challenge. This is a rather opaque town uh, where it's not just process, but understanding the people involved is always a, is always a difficult proposition. Um, t tendency for the executive branch to be easier to navigate um, because there has tended to be less, less uh, change, uh, though under the current administration, there is a degree of unpredictability, I think, that, that presents some, some real challenges. Um, but in addition to the executive branch, of course, the other key is Congress, uh, which is a co-equal branch involved in foreign policy, and in many respects is even more opaque than the, uh, than the executive branch. Um, but there are a number of countries, and I, I would count Mongolia among them as, again, punching above their weight, Taiwan, not, not as nearly as small, but um, Taiwan has done an excellent job, as has Singapore. And there have been a number of things that have been significant in those two countries, uh, uh, sort of navigating uh, through Congress and, and, and U.S. relations generally. In Taiwan's case, it uh, faces the existential threat of China, um, and it's also mobilized Taiwanese Americans around the country. Uh, and use that to its advantage in working on Capitol Hill. Singapore, um, I think, also has done an excellent job, and one of the keys they have had is simply that they've had uh, their officials here at the embassy serving for very long periods of time, so that rather than go in the typical three-year rotation where, where people come through, learn just enough about Washington to sort of get a sense of it, they'll stay on many more years and actually put that education to, to use, um, uh, and so it's not just a case, I mean, you can always pay people on K Street to help you out, um, and they're only too eager to accept uh, the, the money, but um, 
I think it's it's developing uh, some of the relationships with Congress that are that are important. Um, so uh, I I I just think Mongolia has done a pretty good job. But I I wanted to ask my own question, if I might, which is given. Uh, how the U.S. these days is really in somewhat uh, uh, new circumstances and how this administration is a, is a complicated one to understand. Uh, what sort of strategy is, is Mongolia employing to, uh, to maintain its relationship with, uh, with the United States, both in the executive branch and in, with with members of Congress. And um, you did mention uh, North Korea, and of course that's the, the most urgent security threat uh, facing Northeast Asia, if not the world. Um, and I, I do think there, there is you, there's some real benefits that the US could derive from Mongolia's own uh, insights into, into the country and the channels that you have into that country. And I'm curious what uh, some of those contributions might be. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, we, uh, there was a lot on the minister's uh, plate. I don't know whether uh, we, would you, uh, sir, would you like to respond now or maybe take one or two additional questions and then some uh, final remarks? Yeah, up to Is that you. all right? Um, I'm okay. Uh -huh. Because we've got such a uh, knowledgeable audience. I um, wonder if there are one or two uh, questions. If people could identify themselves, I see. Okay, right here. Sam Bena. Thank you. Um, I'm Batulga uh, Batulak, Mongolian graduate student here at SAIS. And I wanted to ask you about, um, about Mongol your opinion on uh, Mongolian uh, policy on regional multilateralism. So Mongolia has pursued multilateral uh, pol uh, policy in the region, and it has been the strongest proponent of regional peace and security in Northeast Asia. But um, I see that countries are increasingly focused on bilateralism or trilateralism, and, um, and I, I would ca uh, call it a retreat from uh, multilateralism. So. Um, to adapt into this changing environment, I'd like to ask your opinion on how Mongolia, how should Mongolia evolve its, uh, uh, change its um, regional multilateral policy? And in the long run, can Mongolia become a, a pioneer of uh, regional multilateralism in Northeast okay. Asia? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, maybe one or two. One question, uh, one question here and then one question here. Very briefly, please. Thank you. Anthony Kim with the Heritage Foundation. Great to see you, Mr. Minister. I just want to tag along the, the excellent question raised by the, one of the commentators. In terms of navigating the new administration in Washington, D.C., if I slightly revise the question, what kind of specific policies would you like to see, Mr. Minister, in terms of really upgrading U.S.-Mongolia economic relationship? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Excellent. Yes? Uh, hello. Um, thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. I especially appreciate that you look at the big systemic issues surrounding globalization. Um, my name is uh, Kubov Zhezhnevsky, and I'm a visiting scholar at the Reichshauer Center. Um, you point out all of the ways that Mongolia has taken advantage of globalization in terms of spurring its growth and consolidating its democracy, but you also note all of the threats to globalization that are coming out of rising inequality, social media, etc. Do you think that the threats will overcome the global system that, as it's construed right now, or is the system strong enough to resist it? And if the system is overcome, do you have any insight on what might replace it and how Mongolia might manage in a new post-globalization world? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, there's a lot on the plate now. So perhaps, Mr. Minister, if you could give us some final comments. Well, uh, thank you for very great questions. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
really uh, because the world is very complex, and very often what we see is not what it is. So, especially in a democratic world, that's what I was talking about. You always have bad coverage, not because people are bad, because the democratic system is built to spur people, to instigate people to do more. What you already did is good, but never enough. The economy grew 10 times. This is a, not many people realize, this is a phenomenal growth. In an authoritarian system, the authoritarian leader would be talking only about this. Look, from within nine years from low-income country, you jumped into you know, middle-income country from GDP per capita of $400. You jumped into $4,000. What more do you want? You keep silence. I'll put you know, on your table food. And we're happy. And only about these achievements you will be talking about. In Mongolia, that's what I like about our system. You know, if you're in government, it's your job. And if you did something good, that's what you vowed for and that's what you promised. You did what you simply promised. That's enough. Now go. Somebody else comes and they do another job. In other words, this system is there to say it's never enough. We want more. We want more. That will be the system. So in this, therefore, environment, saying that this is what it is is very difficult. Because again, as I said, in the media, it's all bad news. But in reality, the economy was performing. It was delivering things that many did not even expect and did not see happening. So that's uh, the thing. And uh, now about this, you said uh, whether Mongolia, you know, is trying to blame the international community globalization on the problems that we're having. No, I, I'm not saying this. What I'm saying is that there is this interesting correlation. We didn't know when we were doing these uh, reforms. One interesting thing is that we would never know that this liberal economy would, within this short time, deliver this much. We never knew. Throughout 90s, we were struggling. And then there were times when we were sort of all the hope was leaving us. There were times when one of our leaders, and I won't name him, was asking our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to develop a ground for qualifying Mongolia as a least developed country in the early 2000s. Why he wanted that? He was saying, we, we were trying to bring foreign investment. Nobody was coming into Mongolia. And then we thought, it is too tough every time to go around the world and beg for money. And, you know, peop, you know with the least developed country status, with less begging, with less labor, you would be getting more aid. That was even the approach at one point. And I was uh, then deputy director of multilateral cooperation. I was at that time, what, 30 and I resisted it. I said, no, no way. Because I was in the department who was supposed to do that research. And I said, I won't be doing this research. Because if we do that, it's, you know, least developed country. If we qualify for that, forget about foreign investment. It won't come. You already qualify yourself as a hopeless, very difficult economy. And then how are you going to get the investment into the country? So... Therefore, there were these sort of times. And then what I'm really trying to say is that irrespective of that, because we were always 
thinking that it's very hard, Mongolia probably will not develop. Boom! All of a sudden you had this inflow of money. All right? And because we were not ready for that, what happened was that the wealth got distributed, not equally, because the system was not ready. Right before that boom, you know what happened? We reduced our taxes when Rio Tinto or uh, our copper mine was starting. You know what was the structure of our taxing? And I was talking about taxes. 15%, I think, the lowest tax, and then 40% on the income that is exceeding $100,000. So basically, for these companies, the only existing taxing would have been 40%, because these two big companies, Rio Tinto, is earning $100,000 probably within an hour. And the rest of the time, they will be paying 40% tax. So. And then this system was, right before this fast growth, was changed into 10%. Because people was not, were not believing that this fast growth will come. And then we reduced it. What happened? All sudden growth came, and very few got really very rich. But in general, the society won. In general, every Mongolian is now living far better life than we Sorry, ever lived before. One example. In Mongolia, now we have traffic jam. We hate it. <laughs> but in the 90s, when I finished my school in 1994, came back from Moscow to Ulaanbaatar, once I was working you know, in the ministry pretty late and around 7 o'clock, Tired, I just went out to have some fresh air. And there was no, and our Ministry of Foreign Affairs is located in the central square of, uh, you know, street of Wambator. No car. Can you believe this is a capital city of a country? No car in the central street. And I was surprised. What happened? There we had this Venezuelan soap opera. The whole country went to see that and then no car. These few cars were there in Mongolia. My father is a driver, and in my family, having a family car was a lifetime dream. Until this socialism wo was over, my family never got a car. Until the socialism was over, 99% of Mongolian families would dream of color TV and cars and would never get it. Now. We have traffic jam. So these jamming cars are not the cars of all the oligarchs. These are ordinary people <laughs> who have their lifetime dream things. And yet we are dissatisfied. In other words, democracy and market economy delivered what it promised to deliver. The only thing is that we moved ahead, and therefore we want more. And that more needs to be given. And then when you see to the other successful guys, they think, yesterday he was my neighbor. How come that today he's an oligarch? And that is the social phenomenon we're living through. Of course, in that you have corruption, unfair practice. Everything is in there. You know. So, this is the process that happened in Mongolia, and that was what we were observing. All of a sudden, when we looked at the global processes, this same thing, same thing turns out to have happened in the world as well. And therefore, the world has become volatile and unpeaceful as in Mongolia, always debating, always, you know, having differences and having no agreement. That's what I wanted to say. In other words, I'm not saying that global problem. On the contrary, what I was trying to say is that global liberties brought a lot of wealth to Mongolia. And we do not want the world to close doors on itself or on others. 
and trying to one by one get themselves out of problem. There is one way out of problem. It's if we try to get together. So that is the answer. Um, second question was uh, about the FTA, Japan, and the EU GSP. Yeah. Again, Mongolia now is very commodity de dependent. And commodities, you know, it is... At this stage, Mongolia is very proud of natural wealth, right? We're 10th richest in terms of natural resource endowment country. But I'm not too proud of that because I or us, we didn't create it. It was created by nature. One, another pride that we have is Chinggis Khan. Well, he lived 800, I'm very proud of that ancestor, but he lived 800 years ago. And if he woke up today and looked at us, he would probably criticizing us, you know, he would probably cry, what did you do to my country, right? So he wouldn't be too proud of us. In other words, again, when we're talking about this pride, there are things that are created by somebody else or by the nature, but there are not many things of, over which we're proud that we create our generation, we created ourselves. And for that, we need to develop processing industry. We need to create new jobs. We need to create competitive products that will be solved, that, exceed, uh, that will be exceeding freely uh, you know, uh, other markets. That we need to do. And in order to do that, what the government has to do, we have to open up the markets for our goods. And therefore, we're working on a uh, free trade agreement with Japan. We're talking about the EU, G, uh, you know, regime of GSP+, plus, etc. That's what we're doing. The aim is to diversify our economy, to create more jobs. But there is one thing I'm very proud of. Recently, again, I won't name that country. I went into a small country with very authoritarian rule, very successful development, high skyscrapers, etc. We also have them, but this is a very orderly country, and in general, economically, they became more prosperous than us. But people are not free. And once I was talking to the students in Mongolia and I said, the freedom system that we have created is taller than authoritarian driven skyscrapers scrapers that are built in other countries. And the fact that we've been, def this is an oriental society. We have never been democratic. And yet, the fact that within 30 years we built the democracy that is not different than the democracy here in the United States is something to be proud of. The fact that people consciously, psychologically, deep in their brain accepted that sense of freedom and is not letting it go is an achievement. And in that, I think we should be proud. So it may be very invisible, but it is a very strong thing that in the long term will be, you know, silently ensuring the growth and development. Now, uh, yeah, what sort of strategy we have towards uh, uh, the United States? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, at least while I'm foreign minister, my strategy will be to be honest. You know, in this world of 7 billion, with this heavy information system, everybody is smart. So if you try to do trick, that won't work. 
You know, there are only 3 million of us who would think, here you have 300 million people who would be thinking, and if the game is about outsmarting, it won't be us, you know. <laughs> so, therefore, what is the best strategy? The best strategy is about being honest, about having this heart of trying to help. Your help may not be big, but at least when you are trying to be helpful to your friends, we're all human beings. Instinctively, you get the same response. So that is a strategy that we should be pursuing. And also, I really think that in modern diplomacy, morality is a much more potent weapon than nuclear weapon. And people may be thinking, you're being romantic. You know, but I'm not. In everyday life, imagine, nuclear weapon is created not to be used. It, it's, it's created not to be shot at. Moral, you know, uh, standards are used on everyday basis. So in terms of the practical use, moral and ethical weapons are much more frequently used than nuclear weapons. So therefore, for smaller countries, if you are really keeping to morality, then you will gain more respect than, you know, many other countries. So this probably will be my approach. And also... Uh, Endeavor, perseverance. You know, we're building democracy not for America or for somebody. We're building democracy for our children, for ourselves, to be free. And therefore, we will keep to that principle. In other words, we will be working on self-improvement. Others may criticize us, others may overlook us, it doesn't matter. As long as my people is free in living a better life, our goal is achieved. And that will be our policy. And that will have a stronger support from other countries as well. So that is another strategy. And third strategy, you know, for example, today in the States, I'm showing this trade balance of Mongolia. What I'm showing is that when Mongolian economy is growing, the trades between uh, the United States and Mongolia is jumping up high. But also the United States should be proud that our trade balance is negative in favor of the United States. So the U.S., you know, it's not like China. The U.S. is making money on Mongolia. <laughs> so therefore, Mongolia is a partner on which the U.S. is profitable. And this is also an approach, you know, we're trying to convey. But we're, again, the honesty. I'm saying, yes, the U.S. is earning money on Mongolia, but we think that we should balance it out. We want to export more. Open up your markets more for us, because small Mongolia is giving you. Now, within 10 years, the trade balances, imbalances, $2.4 billion. So for a small economy, it's not small. When the Mongolian economy is growing, a lot of caterpillars, you know, machinery is bought from the United States. And we're asking also buy some of our products from Mongolia as well. So this is this honest approach when you're openly discussing the issues that you're having in front of you you. Uh, so, Batulga, retreat from multilateralism. Yes, this is happening. This is happening. And, you know, for us, smaller economies, if we try to resist the tide, we will drown. drown. So therefore, you will have to adjust, you know, 
when the global warming is happening, <coughs> you don't try to refrigerate your country, right? You try to develop systems that adjust. So if multilateralism is fading these days, then you try to adjust to it. But at the same time, of course, the very lecture here, not lecture, but remarks of mine that I talk today is pro-multilateralism. What I'm really trying to say is that don't be frustrated in globalization. It delivered what it promised. The only thing is that we human beings are never satisfied with what we have. Interesting thing here. That's why religions were designed. Let's at times really revisit the values of the past. They will be providing a lot of explanation to the things that we're having today. Why religions were created? Because people were never satisfied, never content with what they had. From generation to generation, next generation was always having something more and people were still greedy and wanting more. And therefore you had this Buddhism, uh, Christianity. So therefore, what really I'm trying to say is that we should be really looking, revisiting these values and then really saying that multilateralism worked. We should be preserving it. It is giving us good results. But if we break it, it's easy. But we will all lose. So what I'm trying to say is that what, you, what we see is not always what it is. So we should be really standing up and defending multilateralism as well. But if we only focus on that, Mongolia cannot win the game. So therefore, we should be also getting adjusted as well. Anthony Kim, uh, the economic, how do we na navigate Washington, D.C.? Uh, and how we try to build the economic relationship? Well, it's very difficult to navigate Washington. Because Washington is a very complex system. And even in Washington, not many Americans themselves probably fully understand what's going on in Washington as well. So for us to know what's going on here to the full extent is impossible. Therefore, what I said, we will be coming forward with our genuine, honest approach. And then there won't be big need to navigate but there will be a big need for consistency and trying to get the message across to the decision makers. And Mr. Krishnevsky, the uh, threats will overcome the system. Well, um, it's it's different. It, it may, you know. And the important thing is that for us really to understand and know what the threats are. And then we should really try to uh, avert these threats. Otherwise, these threats really can overcome the system. So probably that should be our strategy. And the exercise of this sort of events is really trying to have various perspective into the threats. And the threats from the United States may look one way. The threat from smaller country, the same threat may look the other way. The more perspectives we have, the better we will understand the threats. And then we will be able to design better system of addressing these threats. But again, the true answer is, I don't know. <laughs> well, you've, you've given us a lot to think about, and you've taught us a lot. So thank you very, very much. And we look forward to another opportunity. Thank you again. Thank you.